Okay, so welcome to everyone to the October 10th Alta Mesa Center for the Arts Reading Series. We are thrilled today to have two fantastic poets joining us, um, James Thomas Stevens and Aja Kushwa Duncan, who, whose books I've been enjoying all week, but also many of the months since I've been introduced to them by Elizabeth Robinson, who will be here to uh, do a QA and a a little bit later. I have the pleasure of giving introductions, but first I'd like, you to wel like to welcome you to the Alta Mesa Center for the Arts. Alta Mesa Center is an interfaith arts and spirituality hub housed within and sponsored by Arenda Community Church. We believe that art is a spiritual act and a human right. We wish to provide a place where people from diverse traditions and artistic practices and economic realities come together in community. We know that art can bridge the divisions, substantive and arbitrary that divide us. We come together not only to practice and teach the arts, but to celebrate and learn from our differences and to foster lively and respectful interdisciplinary dialogues. We seek unity in diversity. So wherever you are on your artistic or your spiritual journey, whoever you are, you are welcome here. Again, today we're grateful to feature remarkable poets, Aja Kushwa Duncan and James Thomas Stevens. And we're here to honor and celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day, which is tomorrow. And to do that, we're going to support the work of an organization called Segura, um, Segoria Te. Now, I'm going to go ahead and bring my screen up a little bit because I'd like you to see just their website because I want you to play with it. I want you to go and not during the reading, of course, but sometime during the day after this, hop on over. Now, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's going. Mm -hmm. When you have a chance, hop on this website. There's mm -hmm. donate now buttons everywhere. But the vision and purpose of this tre tremendous organization is one that inspires me uh, and I think can offer us a real chance to start living a reciprocal relationship with the land and led by indigenous women in the area. Um, I won't talk a tremendous amount about the whole organization because I'd like you to go look for yourselves, but please know that Orinda Community Church and Alta Mesa Center for the Arts both look forward to a long-term lasting relationship with this organization and uh, encourage you also to consider um, donating in one of two ways. One, with the donate button, but also to pay Shumi, which is a land tax on whatever land you currently uh, are, are sitting on. I am on what coastal Miwok land um, in the Sierra, excuse me, that's where my mom is, but in the uh, Oakland Hills. And you can calculate however much tax you owe the indigenous peoples with that button there. It's a small but concrete way of paying reparations for um, sins of many of our fathers, but also to restore right relationship with the land and with the people of this place who belong. My pleasure now is to talk to you a little bit about our, our poets, and then I will disappear into the background and leave you to their wonderful work. Um, first is Aja Kushwa Duncan. She's a social justice coach and capacity builder of Ojibwe, French, and Scottish descent. Her debut collection, Restless Continent by Litmus Press, was selected by Entropy Magazine as one of the best poetry collections of 2016, and it was awarded the California Book Award for Poetry in 2017. Her newest book, which is Vestigial, which looks like this, is just out um, in Litmus Press. Our next poet is James Thomas Stevens, who is a con uh, <coughs> apologize, who is a Aquan. <laughs> I'm gonna to try to say this, Aquanasani Miwok. I apologize, I thought I had that right. He was born, <laughs> he was born in Niagara Falls in New York and grew up between the Six Nations Reserve in Ontario, the birthplace of his grandfather. Um, we're lucky to have him. He's got eight books of poetry, including uh, A Bridge Dead in the Water, which looks like this, 
which will be available both in um, Arenda books, but I'll also have links to all the books we mentioned here over the course of the day. His newest book, The Golden Book, is just out by Split Level Texts. And with that, I will back off. And when you want to see just the authors, you can go up to the upper right corner and click on view and the speaker, and then they will pop up and fill your screen and you can listen. You're welcome to use the chat. I will put in the chat the program and various links to the books, and I will monitor that. Questions will happen about 30, 40 minutes in after Q&A with Elizabeth Robinson, but keep there, keep in mind, and if you wanna put in that chat link, fabulous lines, you're more than welcome. I love your presence. Thank you for your time. And here we go with our, with our reading. This is my cue, is that right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and on stage. <laughs> Da, 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 da. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> hi, everyone. Okay, I'm going to tie myself. Um, yeah, thank you for this. Um, I just found out that James and I have a friend in comma, Chanupa, and um, I really appreciate how he talks about land acknowledgments aren't really land acknowledgments at all. They're people acknowledgments. So, um, and I also deeply appreciate that there's some, some uh, substance to the celebration of this event. So thank you so much. Um, I was invited to do, or both of us were invited to talk a little bit about process. And um, I had just planned to read from Vestigio, but I'm gonna read my afterward. Thank you, James. <laughs> this was sort of an idea I got from you just now. Um, to the first book that was published, um, Restless Continent, as a little bit about the process of that book, which, which certainly engendered some of the process of the book that I'll read. Um, so, I wrote this series, The Alphabet of English and Ojibwe Poems at a time I was recovering so many lost, stolen and forgotten things. I was teaching myself Ojibwe from a dictionary and so doing enacted one of the many ironies of indigenous people's experience, using the culture and systems responsible so much for our people's destruction as a link through which I was able to reclaim some of what had been lost. As my grandfather would say, nothing moves in only one direction. The year I spent in my house at the foot of Mount Tamalpais, named by the Coast Miwok people who call this peak their home, reading the dictionary and writing my way towards Ojibwe, I too was part of a larger revitalization project. Although in a way, in the way of so many generations of my family, I did it unknowingly and alone. I am a writer of opposition, and in so in nomenclature, the words are placed side by side, Ojibwe and English, English and Ojibwe, and yet their meanings are rarely, if ever, the same. Wittgenstein wrote that uttering a word is like striking a note on the keyboard of imagination. And for me, Ojibwe became a kind of music, a way of hearing the world, its animate and intransitive selves. Um, and then this book, Vestigial, I, um, so weird. I had to wear reading glasses like as of last week. I'm like, what, what do I do with these things? Um, the art of, is actually a diptych and it's by uh, a native artist, Kay Walking Stick, who I think is like 85 now and has extraordinary work. So I also just want to lift up her fabulous art. Um, she's a member of the Cherokee Nation. Um, and so in Vestigial, I, I was engaging in another exploration, um, one that started with insects and led me to uh, evolutionary biology. And um, I'm just gonna read the very beginning section of, of this book. And there's a number of different um, epigraphs at the beginning of the book, but this one I think is, is most central. In this dream, only women were born. The men had to be made. Accretion. It begins millions of years ago with algae mats and biophytes. Later, when the water recedes, the earth is stitched with gynosperms, angiosperms, grass fills the open expanse. It begins the way all beginnings do. Everything is new, unknown, cellular. 
the sun spills its full splendor across the landscape. It begins with her opening almost imperceptibly towards the light. It begins with an organism resembling the earthworm. The change is incremental, but over time it grows legs and abdomen, thorax and head. It begins with the Cambrian explosion, the rapid appearance of animal phyla and the evolution of organisms. It begins with sight, with the development of the compound eye, a patchwork of eyes or amatidia, which in their multiplicity provide the ability to see in many directions. There are 25,000 omatidia in the dragonfly, accommodating its swift flight. Intersect, it begins with him, the presencing of a multitude of parts. Compound eyes can assimilate visual changes at a rapid rate, but such hurried processing has its drawbacks. The brain must interpret a composite of different high resolution pictures. It must fuse a moving image. The dragonfly cannot differentiate between an enemy and a mate. It must fight, fly very close to the winged other before it knows what happens next. Tap, 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 sex or death. The visual field of humans, of predators, involves large areas of binocular vision. This improves depth perception, makes possible the chase. It begins at night in the dark interior. She can barely make out his face, but his scent is unmistakable. Pheronomes, it begins with this, a lusting for. Fluttering. Insects travel great distances to satisfy their ecological requirements. He swims the Atlantic, traverses the North American continent, then burrows in. She remains west, developing in situ, a process of adaptation and random selection. Like Darwin's finches, her beak is shaped perfectly to harvest local seeds, her body just small enough to slip between the thorns of the acacia tree. If she, is the if she is the product of sympatric speciation, then he is allopatric, vicariant, genetically isolate. The green hawk moth beats its wings, feeds on the nectar of flowers with the prick of its tongue. From a, from a distance, she mistakes it for a hummingbird. Convergent evolution explains many things how different species develop similar features, how their bodies can fit into each other perfectly, and yet they share neither chromosome nor tongue. How a scent is absorbed by her va, by her va merizonal organ, signaling something to her hypothalamus that she cannot translate into words. It begins with his hands traveling from breasts to thigh, reading the exterior. It begins with her tongue, circling his neck, tasting his heredity. It begins with her arched back, her split abdomen, unleashing waves of pheromones. He flies towards her cascading scent, tracking her location from miles away by the increasing number of molecul moleculars that coat the hair-like olfactory receptors on his antenna. Molecules, I swear English is the weirdest language if you look at a word long enough, molecules was the word. I'm gonna reread that. He flies towards her cascading scent, tracking her location from miles away by the increasing number of molecules that coat the hair-like olfactory receptors on his antenna. It begins with lust, but mistakes itself for love. She sleeps with his armpit in her mouth, licks the fulmentous muskiness. When he leaves, she wraps her face in the cloth of his shirt, sucking his newly male scent, the juice. Their genetic lines are spit by the Western Cordillera, an immense mountain range, dividing the continent as if bones splitting skin. 
On one side are rivers and valleys, and on the other, a vast open plain. At its northern point, the Cordillera is cold and dark. Between ice caps and glaciers, the earth hibernates. But even here, the temperatures are rising. As the Cordillera warms, it wakes and blossoms with an increasing number of fungi species. The rise in temperature leads to an explosion of insects. Highly mobile, they mate quickly, accelerate their life cycles to match the warming planet. As the, worth, as the earth warms, her mating cycle speeds up. She goes from parestis to estrus in a single afternoon. He can sense her swelling labia. The oocyte moved along the cilia, moved along by cilia down her fallopian tube. Let's make a baby, he says, laying her down on the linoleum floor. She opens her mouth, her legs, every orifice rising up to meet him. But he has no seminal vesicles, no prostrate or vast deference. When he comes, there is only the sound of it, an echo of gametes fusing. Convergent evolution cannot explain the biomedical advancements, the rapid transmutation of human systems, it cannot explain what becomes of his secondary sex characteristics, the way a chemical compound enlarges his clitoris and produces a crop of pubescent hair. Chromosomal pairs generally account for sexual morphology, but there are more options than there are types. It is hormones that determine if he sprouts and she sheds, but it is something else entirely that causes her to gather all the detritus and call it her own. Mm. At its southern point, the Cordillera is Madre, a high plateau laced with river valleys. Each day they travel south from the volcanic peaks to the Cordillera's sloping granite tail. Here, he says, take my hand. She reaches for it, holds it tightly for as long as she can. Their journey is striated with extinctions. Most species die out with 10 million years of their first appearance. Hominids have traveled a key for more than six million. With each step, the earth beneath them erodes. Let's see, what time is it? Um, should I go a little bit longer? Should I read the beginning of that? Okay. So weird doing these things on Zoom, like I can't feel the room. I can't feel y'all. can't feel ya. Um, okay, so I'll start the second section. Um, I think I'm going to read the tail end of the second section. Yeah. So this is a little bit later in the second section. Oops. That's how it starts. A little mistake. Not paying attention. Or rather too much attention to the wrong thing. The way his body feels. The way her feels beneath it. Lust is wanting another's body to open in ways that it cannot. Splitting her heart open like a rib his rib, the one she takes from him. He is busy sewing things on, adding parts to the ones too small for him to cherish. But there is no one to suture her heart, stitch the mess of it back together. More than half of all species are insects. Humans are merely a fraction of. He is a small part of her story, and yet he has swallowed almost all of her Begun, the most delicate words. In a land that is not this land, in a time that is not this time, there is a strand of trees in which lives a bird, or rather two birds, but they are fighting and the intensity with which they battle each other makes it appear as if they are one. In a land that is not this land, in a story that is not this story, there is a stand of trees in which live two birds, the birds fall in love, but the feeling is so strange, so unnerving that they lose their ability to fly. They wait there in the tree for the feeling to pass, for their capacity for flight to return. When it doesn't, they begin to worry and in their anxiety, they peck at each other, just to clean each other's feathers or so they say. But the truth is that it's easier to peck than wait 
or worse, to say goodbye to the thing for which their bodies have evolved. The hollow bones, the open spaces between them, amidst the crisscrossing chesses, to make them light, to keep them aloft, their entire skeletal system fused into a single ossification. Surely it is not love, but agabatase for which they were intended. If it had been love, they would have lips and the pillowed flesh of palms with which to caress each other. They wouldn't be so expansively winged. They ponder this in the time between the sun, between the sun's rising and setting. So much time waiting on a branch for flight to return, for love or the passing of it to be enough. I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now coming to the stage is uh, James. Hey, thank you. Um, thank you, Mary, and thank you, Elizabeth, for inviting me. And thank you, Aja, for that really beautiful reading. I have to get the book. It's the kind of work I love, so really excited to hear it. <clears throat> um, before I begin, well, let me introduce myself. Sebal Skanangulagwa, uh, James Thomas Stevens. Um, I'm James Thomas Stevens. I'm from Akwasasne Mohawk, not Miwok Reservation. Um, but I realize you say Miwok a lot more than Mohawk where you are. Um, but um, I just wanted to say I'm from Akwasasne. I'm also Welsh on my father's side. So um, October is the month that we found out my father had a brain tumor. So it's a bittersweet month for me. Um, it brought us together again. I mean, I moved back there. And so I wanted to begin with something that had to do um, with uh, the ritual of condolence, which is a 15 part um, Haudenosaunee, which you probably know as Iroquois. Iroquois is kind of being phased out as we go back to our own real word for Iroquois, which is Haudenosaunee or people who build. Um, but I, first I had to ask Elizabeth a question before I go on because I keep seeing the word orinda and I need to know where that word comes from. I, mean, I am not sure. Um, and I have thought to look that up and I haven't. Does and anybody know? The name of the church or? The name of the town. Of the town, okay. Um, I mention it because this has to do with a word that's so similar that I kept thinking of it, a Mohawk word, orenda, with an E instead of an I. Orenda, which from my reserve, we would pronounce it Olenda because we pronounce our R as an L. Um, but orenda is, for lack of a better term, the level of spirit of aliveness and spirituality in any given group. So when a single person dies in a group, the level of the orenda goes down. So you need to do something to bring it up. Um, and that's mm -hmm. what the condolence ceremony addresses is 15 things to remind people in mourning to remember um, things that we easily forget when we're mourning someone. Things like some of the titles of the 15 sections are tears or one's eyes reminding people to continue to see and not let your vision get totally clouded over. Ears and hearing, keep your, uh, your ears open, keep your throat clear from sobbing so that you can speak, to remember that the sun is moving overhead every day and that it's still an amazing thing. So I'm just gonna read a few of these from the Ritual of Condolence. And they each, I use the, for lack of a better word, again, titles of the sections. They're just what we call the 15 sections, but I use them as the titles of each poem. And they're just short reflections on losses. The Ritual of Condolence. Throat. Of all that rises from that deep pitcher, throat of the flesh body sorely obstructed. When he died, I went to the river and called him like a man from the field at supper time. And the air was filled with the prevalence of absence. And now you leave and when I cry, it sounds like pure adolescence, a simple choking and throttling, embarrassing and shaming, red faced and angered stroking sore Adam's apple. This knot I feel 
is the sum of my words collected in this place. Within his breast, the disordered and wrenched within bed and breast, emotions thrown off in a night of fever dreaming lay tangled on the hardwood among strands of your hair. But today began the work of reorganization and I broke every cup you ever raised to your mouth. I replaced the heart between the lungs, straightened the spleen, the liver in order. But the heart looked like a queer new building standing in place of one once familiar, which even now I cannot recall. The sun is lost. Outside the screen door, a car stares blindly. Behind it, a house bent pole for a clothesline. And behind that, another house and dogs, always dogs. So easy to misplace the movement of the sun. This morning, I found it in the woods, aware of its drawing nearer and nearer to me. And I loved you again in every branch against my arm, realizing the city creates an artificial loathing and you become another thing to get done. But today I burned the houses where they stood and attached the sun again in its place. The council fire. Eager for nothing but anticipation, disappointment lies hard by your lodges at night. Bodies like scattered firebrands around the embers of who you meant to be. You meant to be an artist and cut off your nimble hands. You meant to wear braids and lost your hair at a tender age. You meant to draw a promise to a flame in the clearing, but set it scattering in the brambled stand. The woman and warrior, and I'll mention just for me, that woman was my mother who was with my father till the very end. I noted the hair at his nape turning to oily down, the way the sick transform before diving or taking flight. Preparing a place, he'd smooth the pillow three times before resting his head, once for the father, once for the son, and once for the Holy Ghost. He only died once, and who can know what it was she felt waking to a silence only the planet should know and thrusting his breath to the becoming. And the last one from this series, anything can happen on earth, even insanity. Sleepless for the barking of birds, the dog lays twittering at the foot of the bed. A slow splash caused by the falling away of the mind, the thickening slip of clay from a lake slope strangely excited by this unexpected chance to form and reform fingers from this red earth, that when these hands are complete again, the clouds might cease to squirm. And that's, that's from this book, Coming the Snakes from His Hair, which um, has to do with one of our leaders. I don't know if you can see that picture, that man right there with the snakes for hair, whose name is Aradajo. He was one of the leaders who was keeping our six tribes, the Haudenosaunee, from uniting. And we obviously don't believe he had snakes for hair, but that's how he's pictured to show how twisted his mind was. And Hayan Watha, who some of you have probably heard from the Longfellow bastardization of the real Hayan Watha. Um, Hayan Watha's name means he combs. So he was the one who went and administered reality and truth and peace to Aradajo and, and literally and physically come the snakes from his hair. So this book that was written after my father died was me combing those snakes from my hair that I needed to get rid of and using our own traditional condolence ceremony. Now I'm going to switch to something completely different, um, which is from the Golden Book. And I have, a, I'm going to read the afterword because it explains the process um, of how I use already existing books to write many of my long poems. So I'll read the afterward. The television news drones on down the hall 
It is the day after the Capitol in Washington has been stormed. It's hard to process what's happened, frightening to see so clearly how disparately the different citizens of this country are treated. It's difficult to know how to even begin to put some things into words, how to organize and process. It's for these reasons that I developed my writing method. I need guideposts, some way to reel it in, to herd the many thoughts and emotions. So I turn to random books for structure. Often they're found in the sales bins of ephemera at local used bookstores. In the summer of 1990, I first attended Naropa Institute on a Gerald Red Elk scholarship. It was my introduction to Buddhist thought and philosophy. One of the stresses was on meditation, specifically in poetry, meditating on any given thing long enough to see the relevance to ourselves, to the human condition. The first time I did this with a book that I seemingly had no connection to was with a 1911 insurance booklet that I picked up at a flea market. I was drawn to the handful of black and white illustrations, engravings of accidents, emergencies, and illnesses with titles like removal of foreign matter from the eye, application of a tourniquet, how to secure a splint. As I meditated upon the small book for over two years, it became clear to me that the language used to describe both accidents and treatments could also be used to describe the colonization of North America. The section on asphyxiation quickly drew to mind the largest mass execution in the United States, the hanging of 38 Dakota men on the 26th of December in 1862. Foreign objects in the eye revealed itself as the US obsession with removing foreign objects, i.e. indigenous peoples from American site. I would later rewrite an early American native children's primer to highlight the propagandist grammatical rhetoric used in colonization. The golden book came from my meditation on a 1920s grammar book. As I considered the language employed by grammarians and teachers, I began to realize that it would serve as the perfect scaffolding, allowing me to explore the most important relationships in my own life. Who serves as subordinate clause? What modifiers do we apply to our stories to appear appeasing to our beloveds? Do we fully grasp the difference between shell and will? Okay, so in rewriting that grammar booklet, I kept each of the sections of the long of the book, which turned into a book, the same as the original book. So there's sections on the paragraph, the sentence, punctuation, but I'll start with reading just a short one from, the first chapter was called Know Where You Are Going. And it was about organization of the whole. Know where you are going. Lay him like the carefully surveyed road out before you, in before you. When what is out comes in, the story out the mouth and into the ear, the squash from out the blossom into the broth. A hand from its deerskin mitten to sleet and northern cold. Know where you are going. Lay him carefully out like a map, in like a lion. Know which he you are writing of. He, the pianist carpenter, or he, the poet violinist. In like lions, out like lambs. From the sentence. Whether self-imposed or the one well served, smartly subpoenaed before ever realizing the door is open, delivered as the best way of expressing his desire, each of us a missionary knocking, who knocks, who answers, a robe falling open, sentence to the other's creed, a sentence is merely the setting up of some subject and always with something to say, his predicate, playing up emphasis. Let's say there are two emphatic positions in the relationship, the long haul and the smooth sail. Oh, what we sentence ourselves to for pleasure, what we serve out, what we take in. Two positions, the beginning and the end. 
and what we hear laughs, the sob, the scream, the clang, the motor, the door, the curse, the dog, the key in the lock, the phone set to vibrate is most vivid. Don't sacrifice your strategic final position to a gradual growing apart, a growing tired and I don't really care, and oh good, he's not here, or we can be friends, unless it really is of most significance. In your armada of relationships, each succeeding vessel pushes the preceding from your mind, bumps comically against the now empty hull, or scrapes tragically alongside, but becomes in turn the center of attention, build up to your grand finale, not down from it. Simple words for big ideas. Don't try to sound learned or literary when writing about sex, it demands the simplest words. One should write about it using the very words in which he thinks of it. Never literalize it, lessening individuality and smudging out his color, the sage bundle and its abalone at the foot of the bed. He asked about it jokingly, are you a corandero? And once when we lay in impossibly bright moonlight through the blinds, we looked at our striped legs, torsos and feet. I noted his dark hands and face exposed to the high desert sun, the surprise of dark nipples and even darker sex. The humanos, the striped ones of the southern pueblos, their clay ollas painted, or their clay ollas painted with painted peoples. Tom Piro. Gone now, but you're here next to me, stripped and striped and smelling of rivers. Quote, the homely concrete Anglo-Saxon of which we naturally think and speak more effective than the abstract Latin and his unhappy heritage. I beg to disagree. Colonization via language Quote, that part of our vocabulary which has come to us through the French from the Latin has added greatly to the reach and exactness of the English language, but it's valuable only as an addition to our stock of Anglo-Saxon words, not as a substitute for it, end quote. Our stock, whose stock, who speaks, who listens, who learns, who loses, who knocks, who opens, who is turned away, this evening, you knock lightly at my screen door, screen door. 400 women and children are turned away. Knock lightly, America. We bear our teeth in moonlight. The gold in your mouth gleams. They bear blinding veneers and smash fists against busloads of entering immigrants. They wave flags and carry homemade signs. Return to sender respect our sick country, speak English, America's been invaded. But that was 500 years ago. I lie along your back to cover you. Shell or will, the language of wasps ever buzzing above us, restlessly nestled above the door, watchful the buzzing villan or skulan, wished or obliged, the need to know. The fundamental distinction between active or passive, I, I will have burned many bridges, I shall have burned many more. Cinder and stones beneath this simple rope bridge, gone the connection to and from the carpenter, gone the same from the poet, part villain, part schoolen, part one too many sprouting truths, the constant droning, the were. He will leave tomorrow means he will leave of his own will. He shall leave tomorrow means he's compelled by some force outside himself. When what is out comes in, the story from out the mouth and into the ear, a man from out one country and into another, seed from out the Chihuahuan desert, fertile in our new terrain. And the last poem I'll read from that is, the book ends on business letters and how to write a business letter. 
and I was afraid I would get too didactic or preachy, so I was careful with my business letter. In the form of business letters, there's considerable latitude, though south or north of 32 north may be difficult to navigate. December 1st, 2015, Senor Perfido Frontera, 32.52 north, 25.879 north, Estados Unidos, Mexico, 32692. Dear sir, this morning a bird struck hard against the southwest window. Many feathers were lost. The morning was cold, the sun not yet over the rim of the valley. Once warmed, we were able to get water inside the bird's metronomically panting beak. With time to rest, the bird was able to fly off when impeded. We would like to propose that when possible, the window be kept open, if not removed altogether. For what is an open window, but an extension of home? That something so transparent should be so concrete is detrimental to the timeless migration of many species. Please consider our proposal. Yours truly, a pensador. Postscript. The writing, the speaking, the coming, the going, the remaining together, the splitting apart, the rules, the margins, the spacing, who speaks, who listens, who learns, who loses, who knocks, who opens. Knock lightly, America. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was remarkable. Both of you, thank you. We have time now for a Q&A from uh, Elizabeth Robinson, who will speak to our two poets, but don't worry, there will be time as well to open up the conversation. Uh, I just want to start by thanking you both so much. I feel um, in your work, and I've read both of you over time, that there's truly something at stake, that um, there's something for us to be moved by and to learn and to feel the substance of, um, for lack of more um, articulate of putting it. And um, one of the things that seemed really evident to me in reading your new books and um, in your readings today is to ask about the ability of creative work, poetry. I think Aja, you kind of move through many different genres within a single piece of writing, but I'm gonna say poetry as our shorthand. Like how does it for you conjure intimacy? Um, I feel it in the elegy for your father and poems for a lover in um, a working with the earth and reclamation and recreation in your work, Aja. So um, I guess, against all the resistances and pain and fragmentation, I feel this work of intimacy happening. And I would be curious to hear how you, you understand that or um, would articulate that. Or you can say, ah, oh, what? And talk about something else. I, of course, selfishly want to hear what James has to say about it. <laughs> I don't even know there's like, there's a lot of that question. I will say there are a couple of things that are coming up for me is I'm fascinated with the specificity and imperative sort of gesture of science. <laughs> um, and so, uh, and find it very devoid of intimacy. Um, and so the sort of, by juxtaposing its assertions alongside other kinds of movement as like a way of trying to create some kind of intimacy with language that you know we use with each other, we bridge with each other, colonist tongues, you know, it doesn't matter if it's Spanish or English, they're colonial tongues. Um, so I think that's something that I'm interested in and play with. Um, and um, I wonder if all writers feel this, but I think 
probably my own intimacy issues are such that I had to write in order to generate a level of intimacy with others. So there's probably something there too. Those are some things that I was thinking about. Yeah, I, I just found um, your writing about biology so sexy and um, it like really opens an aperture and creates a sense of possible intimacy in a way that I would not have expected. Um, I, I wanna hear what James says too, but I think for both of you, an, an added question is, you know, like how you're using other genres and other source materials as, you know, if they're colonist tongues, I feel like you're both extremely good at subverting that and um, using those received materials as forms of resistance. And that's extremely interesting too. Um, so if that opens to anything you wanna say. I mean, I, th I think that in that list of colonized, there is tongues that Asha mentioned, whether it's Spanish, English, whatever it is, um, that science is another one. Mm. And I do think that there's a reclaiming of it. I mean, I think of um, the anthology of women's writing that Joy Harjo and Gloria Bird did many years ago, reinventing the enemy's language. I mean, I think that's what we're always doing as native writers is, we've been told so long to make our languages sound like English. It's like, how do we take English, the language that we were forced to grow up with and force it to sound Mohawk or to sound Anishinaabe or to sound everything, Miwok, Chippewa, you know, everything. How do we do that? And I think that's what's exciting to me now is seeing po young poets like, um, really using language, even if it's just a jumping off point, I mean, I'm thinking of some of Lely Long Soldier's beautiful work where it may just be a single word, um, like wakaliape, the Lakota word for coffee. And it touches off this entire poem that somehow reclaims even that single word. But I mean, I love that combination of, in Aja's work of the intimacy and the science. And um, in my graduate schooling, there was a, there is a Canadian poet. He didn't disappear when I got out of grad school, uh, but Christopher Dudney, who you know uses a lot of geology and in, in a really sexy way. And it's just like, just he was doing it. He was one of the first poets I saw because I always loved the language of science. And I mean, I'm always stressing for my students to research, research, research even just for the language, because I said it will give you an entire new set of language that you weren't coming into this poem with. And just a student the other day, a young student, a sophomore, who mentioned a greenhouse in his poem. And I said, well, what's the language of greenhouses? And just after like a few hours of researching, he came back writing all about Tiberius and how it was Tiberius's dream. And he was obsessed with cucumbers. And he's like, it's amazing. Now I have all these concrete images you've been telling me to use. So I think also science gives us those concretes, but then allows us to humanize them by, especially when we turn them into love poems. Um, I don't know, Aja, if you're, if you're looking like you might say something else. No, I'm just really, um treasuring what James has shared. Um, I was I was thinking, James, the final piece you read, um, how you broken a business letter. I mean, the like templates of business letters and, you know, growing up when we typed things, like computers came around when I was in high school, nobody had them. They were insanely expensive and huge. Um, and just like the tyranny and compression and like, de-relationalizing of the letter and then you just break it open so wild widely not wildly widely and just I'm interested in yeah the opening and closing that your work does and just such a I'm very moved by it I was very taken by it and all of the things that you read but in particular what you did in that last piece and 
don't know. There's no question in it. I'm just moved by. Thank you so much. I was really concerned with that letter because it's so much about immigration and having a partner who's undocumented um, and was what that was like during the Trump years that I was, I was, my concern was don't write a business letter that gets too didactic and just kind of goes for the throat. And then one of my practices during the pandemic has been no matter what I'm working on, something from that actual day has to be the central metaphor. And I lucked out that day, the bird wasn't as lucky, although he lived, but um, where I was sitting there at the computer when this robin flew straight into my window. And I lived in a Hogan at that point where seven of my walls were just huge glass windows. And suddenly it was like okay this is the event that happened today that's going to have to turn into the business letter but then it it did make perfect sense where sure open all the windows get rid of the windows like so yeah happy happy coincidence very moving too i mean it does seem to have a kind of political resonance but also a, like a very poignant interpersonal Resonance, and that's what I like about the the movement um, of those poems. That they they feel deeply personal, but they keep reflecting out to a larger world. Um, I was really interested in your conversation with Pragita Pragita Sharma about settler poetics. I don't know, Aja, if you have. Um, read this, but it's in a, a interview in Balm. And um, she, I think she and you together kind of come up with the idea that settler poetics has to do with feeling um, as a native person or in her case, an Indian American, you must perform authenticities in order to be understood. Like there's this great pressure as a native writer or um, a BIPOC writer to perform authenticities. And I thought I would just ask you to talk about your experience with that. As I said before, I feel like both of you are extremely good at using the tools that might oppress to subvert them and open into something else. But I welcome any comments. I guess my first question before answering it is who's authenticity? Are you talking about like us portraying the white authentic vision of a native or? Well, that's what I took her to be saying that there are these sort of imposed authenticities right. um, that, that are really repressive and, and don't permit the full range of expression. And they're not authentic. I mean, I, I've been teaching, I have an intro to native lit course this semester, which I love. And just, we've been looking at a lot of business terminology and they were so confused by that term post Indian, which I was too. I remember the first time I read it in a review, I thought, oh, whoever wrote this meant postmodern. There's no such thing as post Indian. You know, like we're still here. How can it be post Indian? But then realizing that what Visner is saying is that Indian itself with a capital I is a completely white construct that does not exist for any of us individual tribal peoples. So post Indian, I think is a very, um, I mean, I think it's a hopeful thing. I'm, I'm hoping that we're in the post Indian time period where we have moved beyond that white construct that says to be an Indian writer, you have to have traditional dances in there. You have to tell us about your ceremonies. You can't just mention a ceremony. You've got to describe it so that we understand it. No, we don't. <laughs> Those are our ceremonies. Um, but I love that idea of post-Indian and just that we've moved beyond what is a completely manufactured thing. Um, mm. That Indian does not exist. That's an amalgamation and a desire to create something on the Anglo part but it doesn't really exist anywhere. Thanks. <laughs> the, 
there's so much to say here. And I think that that was kind of a mic drop. So like, <laughs> I'm like ending on James's comment. And also like the depth of that conversation would be a conversation I'd want to have with native people and not in an audience like this. Mm -hmm. That doesn't feel like a generative, not at least where I would want to go, you know? Um, so anyway, so yeah. Well, thank you, both of you. Are there other questions that people want to ask about specific works or curiosities that they have? One of the questions I always ask, and this is my fifth time being with the, the group and I'm thankful to be a part of it, is that um, I'm always interested whether it's a novel or a uh, poetry or a sermon is uh, where you get your title from and what are you trying to say with the title of your book, The Golden Book and other titles of your mess, uh, poetry, of both of you. Uh, that's one question. And the other question I always asked is, um, uh, I'm always interested in your creativity and the motivation behind what you write. And is it important for you to have people affirm that, uh, to hear that, or are you just content to have it done whether people respond or not? So that was my seem to lead two questions I always ask as a part of this group. And that's I'll start, Asha, since I feel like I was, I don't want to answer things too quickly. I'm interested, Asha, in your, in the title of your vestigial book too. Uh, yeah, so, you know, as you, when we were talking earlier, we were talking about like the notions of how long a book takes. So this book was, I think done eight years ago, took two years for the publishers to like decide to publish it. You know, anyway, so a long time ago. So I can't cite the exact moment where I came up with the title, but I will say that, you know, to troubling notions of science, um, vestigial, as I understand it refers to like things that are no longer evolutionarily necessary, but are physiologically present, right? Which, you know, Western medicine has an interesting number of things they decided were vestigial in the human body. And then it was like, mm, turns out not so much. Like the tonsils, for instance, are kind of critical, <laughs> really part of our healing and um, maintaining of wellness. So, you know, it's just, it's playing with that notion, you know, that just because you don't know what something's for doesn't mean it doesn't have a reason for being, you know? Um, so that, that is sort of the spirit of the title. One of the second part of that question is that how do you feel people respond? Are you concerned about how they respond? Do you want to take that one, James? <laughs> sure, I can. Um, for me personally, I mean, it's it's a belief that when I'm writing some, I'm never thinking of an audience, whether that's good or bad. Um, I know it's one of the things publishers immediately, initially ask you when they accept your book is write me a you know write me a page of who your you know your audience is. Who are we going to be selling to? Um, and that's never a thought in my mind is, I mean, I have no idea who my, well, I know there's like five or six friends who write in similar veins that I know they're going to read my work because I read their work and we have conversations about it, but I'm, I'm never thinking of it in terms of marketing or who's going to reply. Um, to me, I create something because it's something I need in my world to feel okay. Mm -hmm. is what I've always said about it. Like, if it comes out in a book form, great. If it didn't, it was something that, and I believe, I mean, I began as a visual artist and it was the same when I was working on sculpture and people would ask me, why did you make that? Not to show it or to sell it, I made it because I needed to feel okay in my world. 
I need it to exist. So that's how I feel about books. When people do respond, especially favorably, I mean, it's, it's a bonus. I mean, it's an added thing where, oh, somebody else feels that way or somebody else can empathize um, or has had those thoughts. But, and then in terms of my titles, I mean, the golden book clearly just came from the fact that that grammar book was called the golden book of grammar. And I, my first thought was to actually name it in Mohawk. I wanted to name um, golden book in Mohawk is Niwa Sageton Obwadrasantan, which I knew nobody would be able to pronounce. I just wanted to see a damn book with the Mohawk title on it on a mm -hmm. shelf instead of always seeing English titles. Um, mm -hmm. But many different people who looked at it, publishers said, no, we can't really do a long Mohawk title like that. Um, and I said, well, it could say the golden book in parentheses. Um, but, um, and then other books I mentioned, this one has to do with combing the snakes from his hair, it just has to do with one of our cultural um, oral traditions of Hayanwata going to Aradaho and coming all the evil out of his mind. Um, and it was after my father's death, so I thought I need to create something that combs the snakes from my hair. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mike. Yeah, uh, kind of related to that. I was curious as poets, but you find your primary sources for for inspiration? Is it your uh, your 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 dreams, your uh, contact with nature, or is it your desire to articulate your uh, your cultural experience? Um, mm -hmm. Seeking a sense of seeking justice on behalf of your culture. Uh, do you feel that there's been some some primary motivations that uh, you can share with us here? You have to a certain extent already. But, uh, mm -hmm. Everyone has a, has a different motive for, for writing, I think. I think what my motivation for writing is. I mean, I don't really seek to, I mean, I'm not really seeking justice because I don't think it's, I think it's a bit too late for that in a certain way. I'm just seeking to spread an awareness of things um, and share that there's different ways of looking at things. I mean, even, um, I, I just always try to get students like, Unfortunately, we lost so much of native languages, but I mean, I often will give an entire like two hour lesson just on one Mohawk word. And often I'll choose the word for horse, which is agosados. And what that literally means, if you take it apart etymologically is, it means it breaks down into the, that, because we don't just have a word for that. You'd say the, that thing, the, that over there. So it means the, that animate thing, there's a sound in it that lets us know it's alive. And it means so that that animate thing that stands next to itself. And I say like, here's why when we talk about lost in translation, it's a huge thing because to just say, if I were talking about something and I said, Ablosados, and somebody said, what does that mean? And I said, horse. That doesn't say anything about how we see, I mean, but then I have my students analyze, well, why would it be called the that thing that stands next to itself? Like, what does that even mean? And they guess a lot of things and eventually they'll, and I'll say, I'll usually have to lead them to, well, how would my people, Haudenosaunee people, Ganyangihaga, Mohawk people have seen horses the first time on the East Coast? And then they say, well, they'd probably be with pilgrims or somebody in their minds, you know? And, and I said, well, Europeans, yes. Yeah, so, and I said, how would they be presented? And then eventually somebody comes with, oh, they were probably, you know, tied together pulling a wagon. So I said, well, for Mohawk people, that was really weird to have an animal that was always standing next to itself, <laughs> standing next to its own image. 
And I said, that's what we lose when we lose language is the whole way that we saw things. Um, so, I mean, for me, when I use, especially when I use Mohawk language, I'm not, there's no justice I'm trying to seek or I'm just trying to get people to see that we all see differently and in a very personal way. And when we lose our languages, we lose things like that. I mean, the, I, when I was an undergraduate here at IAIA before I taught here, I would often translate things just from Mohawk at like that word, the that thing beside itself. And I remember Arthur Z, my professor saying, oh, you must like the language poets in the Bay Area. I had no idea who the language poets were. I was just literally translating individual words. Uh, but often I just use Mohawk words as the basis of a lesson because they're, they're beautiful. I mean, it makes sense that a turtle, which I don't know what that means in English, turtle, I know what a turtle is, but the Mohawk word anowala means it carries its house, which makes way more sense to me than turtle. Um, so yeah, it's just for me personally, not seeking anything other than sharing that there's different ways. Thank you. I love what you were saying about like the work is so you can be okay in the world. And I think like for me, writing was a way to make space for myself and my various um, histories and identities and lineages. And, um, and, you know, I mean, I think just listening to the both of us, like clearly a real love of words <laughs> is at stake. Um, I have a, a new teacher who a lot of people seem to have known about, but I just met him recently, Bayou Akamalafe, and um, he, uh, in a lecture this week, talked about how things don't precede relationships, um, and relationship being a big thing, right? Not like just an affair or friends, or but like everything is in dynamic relationship to something else, and I think for me that's also writing is. Uh, enjoying the dynamic that emerges from things being in relationship to each other. Um, and I, you know, I spend, I live in the woods. I spend a lot of time alone outside. <laughs> um, and I, I sort of would joke that like, you know, crows and deer are my inspiration, but they just don't seem to like reading my work very much. Um, so I don't know why I'm writing <laughs> to humans in mostly English, when in fact, much, much of my time is spent in dialogue with, with beings that do not seem as obsessed with words. Mm, interesting. Well, I've heard that expressed often, you know, just a, a love of words, uh, yeah. more often with poets than just writers in general, I think, but thank you. I wish we were writing for our animal friends. I mean, I live out in Canyon Cito too in a canyon and I see more, especially during the pandemic, spend more times with like the gray fox and the mountain lion that comes down once in a while. I don't spend a lot of time with the mountain lion, <laughs> but the gray foxes and the coyotes. I mean, and especially during the pandemic, I think it made all of us better seers. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people who hadn't been forced to be stable and at home for a long time didn't really know what went on around their houses and i one of the few poems i wrote during the pandemic begins with i guess they were always there the rabbits you know but suddenly i was aware that there were like hundreds of them because i was watching my dog watch them and he was constantly running to look at something and i thought these are things i miss when i'm at work or i'm just busy um, but i do think that for so many people I talk to about the pandemic, one of the things that comes up is they realize how much they were missing in just seeing what was happening around them. Well, I think that um, it comes up in Aja's work also that, you know, presencing and maybe 
just pausing to absorb what is there. And as you say, kind of carry it in a different way or portray it in a different way is a way of really manifesting and presencing. And that is the way I experience both of your work. So you're such different writers. I'm, I am aware that is just about 515. So I don't know if there's any other comments but I want to sincerely thank you for your work, which means a lot to me and your conversation, which has been very, very satisfying. Thank you for the invite. And thank you, Aja. It was great hearing you read. I really love the work. Thank you to both of you. This has been a wonderful reading. And someone said today that attention might be the first step towards a kind of reparation. The tension that I felt in the room today, even the Zoom room was um, special. We have a, a couple events coming up. I'll put them in the margins, but also take a look at the link to donate to Seguarte Land Trust and begin that process of, of reparations. The book links are all the way up through. I really recommend these works and I thank you for your presence here today. Thank you to James and to Aja uh, for your work and for writing because you must. Any other questions or comments before we adjourn today? Miigwech everyone. Thank you for, for joining us and deep, deep gratitude for the introduction to another queer native writer whose work I did not know and have a friend in common and now want to read everything that you've ever written. Can't wait. <laughs> I feel the same about your work. So I'll, um, be, I'll be looking for it. Thank you. Many thanks. Hey, thank you. Go in peace, my friends. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.